Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. For success. And we are going to present a wonderful lesson. But before we do that, Greg, could you invite the most important member for our lesson? Amen. It would be my pleasure. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a beautiful Sabbath morning. And Lord, we ask and pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit to be with us, to guide us and direct us through your word. Help us to focus on the points and the principles that you want us to take to heart and to share with others. We ask and pray for a special blessing upon our AV team who makes this possible for our online viewers. And we just ask and pray also that your Holy Spirit be with each of us so that we will honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you. Planning for success. Sounds good, right? But before we begin planning, what are we planning for? So let's see how Merriam-Webster defines success, first of all. A degree of measure of succeeding. Okay, that's kind of obvious. But, um, and then B, favorable or desired outcome. Also, the attainment of wealth, favor, or eminent. And then another um, definition is one that succeeds. So I love that word eminence, a position of prominence or superiority. They even use that in the Catholic Church for cardinals, you know, like your eminence and things like that. So Miriam Webster's definition is what most people think of when they think of being successful, right? Having one or more of those attributes. Now, things change over time, and definitions do as well. So I typed in Google, because, you know, it's everyone's research tool, um, what, the definition, what is the definition of success in life? And the answer, according to Very Well Mine, along with very other, various other sites, success is often defined as the ability to reach your goals in life, whatever those goals may be. In some ways, a better word for success might be attainment, accomplishment, or progress. It is not necessary, necessarily a destination, but a journey that helps develop the skills and resources you need to thrive. I like that, Amen. if applied correctly. But I think we may be on to something here. So let's set, look at some goals. We can, to attain, accomplish, or progress, to move forward, or keep growing even in something. Now that sounds like something I might want to do. Many in the world look at success as status or position, or and or the money of the person, but I'm thinking number two is more on track for today's lesson. If you had one person in this life to impress with the success of your life, to be noticed, who would it be? Would it be the president of the United States? Perhaps it'd be one of your favorite athletes, you know, successful in your own eyes, like LeBron James or Tom Brady, something like that, right? Or perhaps those Nobel Prize folks, they're, they're a lot to impress. These would all be good by the world standards, but there is another standard of success by one who transcends all the world standards, Jesus. But what does Jesus define as success? What matters to him? You see, in the worldly success, it's all about me. And I mean that. What goal I set for myself. What attainment I achieved. What thing I have accomplished. You see, the worldly problem here, it's an I problem. It's all about me. But with Jesus, it's all about your relationship with him. Which brings us to our memory verse, Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Would you consider Moses successful? How about Joshua? Joshua. He did take over Canaan, after all. How did Joshua achieve that level of success, especially following Moses, right, with the exodus and all that? Joshua 1, verses 7 and 8. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all that the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. 
Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will, you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. How did he accomplish that success? Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua didn't have an eye problem. His success was through serving the Lord. So let's look at one other story in the Bible. John the Baptist. So John's parents were Zacharias and Elizabeth. They were both well advanced in years. Simply put, for Elizabeth, menopause was a distant memory. And yet she conceives a child full of the Holy Spirit, and they call him John. Luke 1.17 says, It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So John has a ministry with disciples and a message of repentance. And many came to see him in the desert, in the middle of nowhere, literally. Then he baptizes Jesus, and suddenly his ministry hits a downward spiral. He gets arrested by Herod, because Herod didn't like what he said about his relationship with his wife, his brother's sister, um, and thrown into jail. Now, then he gets beheaded because of Herod's niece doing a sultry dance for him. I'm not even going to go there on that one. And that's the end for John. Did he have wealth, favor, eminence? No. What influence he did had faded long ago. He was a has-been. Kind of like one of those one-hit wonder bands that you never hear of again. But we know what God says. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, uh, nor your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So how successful was John the Baptist then? Well, let's hear it from God himself on earth. Luke 7, 26 through 28, Jesus says, But what did you go to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one who, about whom it is written, Behold, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your, or your way before you. I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So really what Jesus is saying is, in other words, naturally born of women, you know, Jesus excluded, there's no one greater than John. And I think back to Moses and all these things, but John was the one, the promise of the Messiah was given back in Genesis 3.15, something that Abraham, Moses, and all the prophets look forward to. But it was John who sacrificed all to prepare the way for the Lord. That is a success story. If there was one verse to sum up success in God's eyes, it would be Matthew 6.33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You may not have wealth or favor or eminence in this world, but you will definitely catch the attention of the king of the universe. And your success with him will bring you to New Jerusalem and an eternity of riches in Christ Jesus. Now that is success. Mary, can you tell us about Sunday's lesson, First Things First? Yes, and actually what you just shared with us the verses at the very end is a great segue into it. I so, see how God works. That's right. 
So what does the Bible say about success in the context of basic stewardship and financial principles? What about providing for our basic needs? And what does it teach regarding life principles for obtaining success? Well, the scriptures tell us and teach us that we should seek the Lord while we're young. In Ecclesiastes 12, 1, King Solomon wrote, Remember now your creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come and the years draw near, when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Now, for those who are older and didn't make a choice for Jesus in their younger years, there is still time to make the right decision regarding stewardship starting now, whatever your age may be. We have an example in the life of Jacob. After deceiving his father and fleeing from his angry brother, he spent a night in a field where he had an encounter with God in a vision. It's recorded in Genesis 28, 10 to 22, and we've read that previously um, in this quarter's lesson. And here, Jacob made some important life choices, both spiritually and financially. In the vision, the Lord introduced himself to Jacob as the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. That's in verse 13. Then as part of his vow to God, Jacob stated, the Lord shall be my God. That's in verse 21. At that moment, he made the conscious choice to believe, choose, and serve the creator God of his fathers. This is the life-changing choice that we all must make first. And we must keep that decision ever present in our lives if we want to be truly successful by God's terms. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gave us the most vital financial tip recorded in history. And Byron mentioned it just a few minutes ago. In Matthew 6, 31 to 33, he said, therefore do not worry, a say, worry excuse me, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows what, that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. According to this passage, what is the first principle for success? Seek the kingdom of God. Seek him and his righteousness, and your food, water, clothing, your basic necessities will be assured. In the Old Testament, God spoke to Joshua after the death of Moses. As Byron read earlier, when they were about to cross into the promised land over the Jordan River, and I'm going to reread this because there's some very important things to note here that we need to be aware of to be successful. God told him, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper or be successful wherever you go. And this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Now these words from the Lord were a repetition of God's counsel to Moses that was recorded in Deuteronomy 28, 1 and 2. And there he says, now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. In other words, you'll be more successful than the other nations. 
and it continues and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. So the blessings were promised to Joshua and God's people on the condition of obedience and they were assured of good success. Now I want to point out that this obedience must be based upon our love for God. Remember that in John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So love is the motivating force behind obedience. Obedience is our response to God when we realize what matchless love he has shown in redeeming us. As 1 John 4, 19 states, we love him because he first loved us. Another component that goes hand in hand with obedience is trust. We need to trust in the Lord to direct our paths. God spoke these words to Jeremiah in chapter 24, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Why would we not want to trust a God who makes such a promise as this? When we accept that God is trustworthy, we will accept the instruction to seek his counsel in all we intend to accomplish and all the goals we set for ourselves. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. So let's summarize the first steps. I'm saying steps, not just one. Steps for planning and obtaining true success. The first one is choose God. Choose his kingdom and his righteousness, and make that choice as early in your life as possible. Secondly, Choose to obey God's commandments and instructions as a love response. By his grace and in his power, meditate upon his commandments, and then with courage and strength, seek to diligently apply them in your life. And then third, trust in the Lord and seek him to direct your path. I'd like to end with a quote from the book, The Adventist Home, which states, God only can give true success. Yoked up with Christ, men and women will become more precious than gold. Ultimately, if we want to be truly successful in this life, we must first be yoked up with Christ. Amen. Thank you, Mary. <clears throat> Greg, the blessing of work. The blessing Ideally, of work. it is not a four- letter word it is not just that it's a four letter word that is to be a blessing okay so good morning again and happy sabbath to you and monday's lesson is titled the blessing of work ideally unless you're independently wealthy and at some point in your life unless you are independently wealthy you're going to have to work we all have to work regardless of needing to work or not God intends for us to work. Ideally, of course, it would be if we could find work that you could really enjoy and make a comfortable living at, right? Well, that's ideal, but that's not always going to turn out that way. So let's open our Bibles again, and let's better understand about what God tells us about work. So let's begin with looking at Genesis 2.15. And God said, Then the Lord took the man, and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So from the very beginning of creation, of humanity, before sin entered humanity, God intended for us to work. And now after sin had occurred, God tells us in Exodus three seventeen through 20, essentially that cursed would be the ground for our sake. Work would be different and become more difficult than it was in the Garden of Eden, but nonetheless, it was still necessary. Let's move to Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 10. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We know this scripture very well. 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord. In it you shall do no work, nor you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger who is within the gates. So here embedded in the fourth commandment, which focuses our attention on the Sabbath, it also highlights the necessity of work, our weekly work. Six days we shall work. Let's move on to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. So with the work we are to do, we are to do it with all our might for God. Let's now move to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. And this is Paul speaking to the Thessalonians. Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. So wow, this really brings it home to us today. And we all know this. Work is something that it's a necessity, but it's a blessing. There's many blessings that come from that, and we're going to touch on that in just a minute. Lastly, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. So our working may be a blessing not only to ourselves and our family, but our working can also become a blessing for others who may be in need. The funds that we earn, the income, or back in biblical times, the harder you work, you may have had more crops to give to someone who was in need. So work is very important, not just for ourselves and our families, but for others to help others in need. So now we have a biblical foundation of God's intention for humanity to work. Beginning before sin in the Garden of Eden and after sin entered humanity, though the conditions of work had changed. So why do you believe that God intended us to work? Perhaps to bring us closer to him? What about to learn important principles or to help shape our character and to help participate with him in accomplishing something to be a blessing for ourselves, for our families, and for others? Unfortunately, I'm not so sure our society today views this perspective in the same manner or to the same degree as in years past. In Messages to the Young People, page 229, Ellen White states, Is it the disposition generally among servants to do as much as possible? Hmm. Is it not rather the prevalent fashion to slide through the work as quickly, as easily as possible, and obtain the wages as at as little cost to themselves as they can? The object is not to be as thorough as possible, but to get the remunerations. That's the payment, the reward for the work. That's where the concentration is on, not in the process, but getting that reward. Those who profess to be servants of Christ should not forget the injunction of the Apostle Paul. And this is where she quotes Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. And we've, we've read this before, but let's go through this again. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that the Lord that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. And then Ellen White continues on, and she says, and I thought this was a a very poignant um, principle that we should keep in mind here. The essential, the the thing essential for successful work is a knowledge of Christ. For this knowledge will give sound principles of right, impart a noble, unselfish spirit, like that of our Savior, whom we profess to serve. Faithfulness, economy, caretaking, thoroughness should characterize all our work wherever we may be, whether in the kitchen, 
in the workshop, in the office of publication, in the sanitarium, in the college, or whatever or wherever we are stationed in the vineyard of the Lord. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, but he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. So, again, we need to keep in mind that God designed work not only to be a necessity, but to be a blessing for humanity, both spiritually, mentally, physically, and financially. And yes, it may be hard, it may be trying at times, and sometimes even um, unfair, no doubt. That's the world that we live in. But nonetheless, we must work. Again, remember the fourth commandment, six days we shall do all the labor and thy work. But God designed work to be a blessing for us and for lessons to be learned and for others who may be in need, whom we can help. So in closing, let's just keep in mind what the Lord tells us through Paul in Colossians 3, 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So in all our work, for whomever we work for, regardless of title or position, may we do our work in the honor and glory of God and with thanks, because the work that he provides is a blessing. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Greg. Pleasure. Okay, Tuesday. The earning years. <clears throat> I'll tell you, I wasn't very thrilled with this lesson at first. I wanted theirs. But God has a purpose for all this. So no matter what, we know that we have to work. Our bodies are literally made for it, even before sin. In Monday's lesson, we saw that whatever we do, hopefully it is a blessing. But now we enter into the, as the title for this section calls, the earning years. Or as some call it, the daily grind. This usually is a time when you're out of college, you're working in the career of your choice, and you're probably married by now. And roughly in 40 years, you will buy a house, have children, put them through school, private school or college or both, plan for retirement, etc. Just some small stuff, right? This, or there is a phase that you probably have heard of before. Men plan and God laughs. That means that when we make our own plans without his counsel, God is amused because we actually think we know what's going on. That we have sufficient wisdom to do it all on our own. Yeah, how does that end? So this lesson talks about how delicate this time is, especially in the beginning of these years. So let me ask you, say you're married during this time, right? What are the top two reasons for divorce? Number one is marital infidelity, cheating. That's simple, right? But number two is financial disagreements, money. Studies have indicated that frequent fights about money are a strong uh, predictor of divorce. Given the high level of stress that can accompany financial decisions, this statistic is all too believable. So in these earning years, where we should we get our counsel from? God and his word. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Worse than an unbeliever, huh? Oh, it goes to the Bible to reference the Bible, huh? So Matthew 7, 9 through 11 or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, you will, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, not even an unbeliever, evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? If evil knows how to take care of their own and we're supposed to be emulating Christ in that household, and that's expanded greatly in Ephesians 5 and the beginning of 6, then what should we be doing? We should be emulating Christ. Being a person of action in these years is vital. Not just a talker. Have you met people who talk a lot and do little? 
You have to be a doer. Proverbs 14.23 says, In all labor there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. And 2 Thessalonians 3.10-11, For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Have you ever known that person? They usually don't achieve those goals, do they? So we are to do our work and to do, do it well as God directs us to him. Greg, you touched on that significantly. Um, Colossians 3, 23 through 25, and we have some scripture overlap. Sorry, but um, whatever you do, do it, you your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. I will just say, I know people in this world who do many things that are not right to obtain wealth and things like that, and you see the effects it has on them later on in life as well. It's not good. Working with integrity is so important during these years that it, you really realize that it will come back if you don't. It will come back on you, as verse 25 says. But during these earning years, the most important thing that one can do is to raise their children, if you have any. For those who have children, this is paramount. Psalms 127.3 says, Behold, children are the gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Enoch realized this after the birth of Methuselah and walked with God for 300 years. How big of a job is it to raise a child? Okay, huge. Just think of it that way. You realize that a child by age five has already capped on their behavioral development? Everything after five years old will be built upon, but that foundation is already set. Where do they learn that from? from their home. It is so important to have good, godly examples for these children from day one. It is literally priceless. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he was old, he will not depart from it. Or we even see in the church, they might stray for a while, but they come back. Now the lesson had three primary things for children that I want to actually repeat. It was very good. Provide a Christian home environment. This would include regular and interesting family worship, regular Sabbath school and church attendance, and faithfulness in tithes and offerings. These are the great habits to form early in life. Don't make church something they dread or worship something they're dying to get out of. Number two is teach the children a willingness to work and an appreciation for it. I'll tell you, when I was 16 years old, my mom said, have you applied for jobs yet? Because you're going to work, and you learn those ethics young in life. Children will discover that diligence and integrity at work are always noticed, appreciated, and rewarded. They will learn that money comes to us as a result of our giving time to others by performing tasks that are valuable to them. You need to work to eat. It is that simple. There are no, even though today they believe differently, there's no free train of food and, and goods in this world. And number three, help with a good education. Education is expensive today, particularly Christian private school and education. And we know people in this church that send their kids to Adventist school. But to parents with plans for their children, not only for this life, but also that which is to come. You prepare them for this life and hopefully put them on the track towards eternal life. It's well worth the cost. We see this. This is equipping your children to have the success in their own life, that they can focus in and follow God's word and have that 
overspill into their lives in this world. God is the only one who can teach you to manage you through the earning years to accomplish all of these things. Your children will choose their own path in life. I didn't like the way the lesson put it, even if they turn out basically not the best. No, God's always working on them too. Um, and they choose their own path, but parents are to provide for them as God provides for us and to teach them to choose wisely in Christ Jesus, not only when they grow up, but for all their days. Mary, working with integrity. Yes, this is a very essential practical step in achieving success. God calls his children, he calls us to a higher standard in work and life in general. And that standard is found in Jeremiah 31, 33, which says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they will be my people. So God's standard is his law written in our hearts and reflected in our characters. Now, our society is drastically changing, and Christian values are being diluted and minimized. It has and will become even more so um, important for individual Christians to live and work on a level that's above reproach. God's sacred word says in Proverbs 22, 1, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches loving favor rather than silver and gold. So in the scriptures, your name refers to your character. So we could say a good character is to be chosen rather than great riches. Does the Bible give us examples of individuals whose employers recognized they were blessed because of having a godly employee? Can you think of any? I thought of Jacob, Joseph, Daniel. We're going to study Joseph's experience while in Egypt. He had been sold into slavery by his brothers. And in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 214, we read about a decision he made after realizing his predicament, that he was leaving home and he wasn't coming back. This is what it says. His soul thrilled with a high resolve in, uh, to prove himself true to God. Under all circumstances, to act as became a subject of the kingdom of heaven, he would serve the Lord with undivided heart. He would meet the trials of his lot with fortitude and perform, perform every duty with fidelity. So making and reaffirming such a determined resolution in our lives is a key to success, as we saw and we will see that it was a success for Joseph. So Joseph resolves to prove himself true to God. Next, he arrives in Egypt, and God's providence brings him into the ownership of Potiphar, who's the officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. And Joseph gets to work. Let's read what happens to him in Genesis 39, 2-5. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. So let's stop here for a moment. From this one verse, why was Joseph successful? because the Lord was with him. Remember, he had resolved to serve the Lord with undivided heart, with fortitude, and with fidelity. So again, he's showing that we need to choose God first and serve him wholeheartedly. Let's continue. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper or be successful in his hand. So let's pause again. Scripture states that Potiphar noticed that the Lord was with Joseph. So how did Potiphar, a pagan worshiping Egyptian, know about the Lord? In Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White continues, 
he, meaning Joseph, was not ashamed of the religion of his fathers. And he made no effort to hide the fact that he was a worshiper of Jehovah. Joseph shared God with Potiphar and all of those around him. This is another principle we need to incorporate into our work ethic. Let's continue with verse 4. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. Potiphar knows, noticed Joseph's work ethic and upright character and promoted him accordingly to the position of manager of his estate. Verse 5 says, So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. So the result of Joseph's business integrity in managing his master's estate was not only everyone within the house, but even the animals, the land, the crops outside in the field were blessed. Ellen White continues with this commentary, and I want you to pay close attention to this. The marked prosperity which attended everything placed under Joseph's care was not the result of a direct miracle, but his industry, or hard work, his care and energy were crowned with the divine blessing. Joseph attributed his success to the favor of God, and even his idolatrous master accepted this as the secret of his unparalleled prosperity. Without steadfast, well-directed effort, however, success could never have been attained. So we needed to be steadfast and have well-directed effort. She continues, God was glorified by the faithfulness of his servant. It was his purpose that in purity and uprightness, the believer in God should appear in marked contrast to the worshipers of idols. In Matthew 5.16, Jesus similarly encourages us, saying, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And in 1 Corinthians 10.31, Paul counsels us, saying, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. This makes perfect sense when we realize for whom we are managing. The worldly seek prosperity in order to spend and accumulate. But Christians seek to prosper in order to provide for personal needs and the needs of others and to help advance the cause of God and glorify him. The scriptures are replete with advice regarding our work ethic. This applies to our financial management, but also our line of work and whatever else we set our mind to do. So in summary, what we've learned today is that working with integrity entails a number of things, and I'm going to highlight them here. Resolving to prove ourselves true to God, glorifying God in all we do, acting as a subject of the kingdom of heaven at all times, serving the Lord with undivided heart, meeting trials with fortitude, performing every duty with fidelity, and the last two, working diligently with care and energy, and working steadfastly with directed effort. If we endeavor to implement these principles into our work ethics and lives, God will bless our efforts and give us true prosperity and success. Integrity is kind of missing in the world today. And you know where the phrase, it's hard to find good help comes from. Mm -hmm. And when you do, you keep them. Greg, can you tell us about seeking godly counsel? Yes, I will do that. So again, Thursday's lesson is titled Seeking, God's, Seeking Godly Counsel. And today's lesson centers on the biblical counsel on financial management. 
And I want to say this first. As we know in Scripture, when the Lord wants to make a point, oftentimes he repeats something two or three times. I feel the Holy Spirit has led us in our presentation of this week's lesson because we have a number of times read the same Scripture two and now maybe even three times on some of them. But the purpose being is God wants us to take his guidance, his counsel to heart. So let's dig in right now, and let's look and see what the Bible has to say on, on financial management. If we become blessed with some financial wealth, in our culture, it's typical to seek out professional advice for financial management. But God warns us against consulting them for the management of his assets that he has entrusted us with. So let's see, again, let's start digging into this a little bit deeper to see what God has to say and how God warns us about this. Let's look at Psalms 1, verse 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful, but he delights in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So what point is King David making here? He's saying, first, don't put your trust in man. God wants us to come to him. Let's move on to Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. We've heard this earlier this week. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. It doesn't matter what degrees you have, what schools you went to, what experience you have. Don't trust on that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. That is a huge problem for us today. People are seeking praise. People get praise, and then in their own eyes, they think that they have wisdom. But God's saying, fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. So praise God for telling us that. He's telling us to trust in him in his ways and not in our own understanding. So let's dive just a little bit deeper. And the Bible provides godly counsel on financial management. But let's take a look at a few principles. And these principles were also mentioned earlier. God willing, they'll sound familiar because they've been mentioned earlier. A few of them have been. So let's, we're going to put these in a little bit different order than what the lesson has. But essentially they're the same thing. But there's a reason for putting them in this order. And there's seven principles that we're going to touch on. First is, and this sounds very familiar, seek God and his kingdom first. Before we do anything, whether it's work, working with integrity, relationships, if it has to do with financial management, seek God and his kingdom first. Matthew 6, 31 through 33 tells us that. And in verse 33, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So again, first is seek God and his kingdom first. Second, and again, we've heard this as well. Be obedient and faithful to God. When people make accusations that if you keep the commandments or you try to keep the commandments, that you're a legalist. Well, let's see what Jesus says. In John 14, uh, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. So the obedience is to be out of love. Deuteronomy 28, verse 9, and then 12 through 14 that has to do with, um, well, let me just read this. Verse 9, the Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Then verses 12 through 14 tell, of, tell us of all the blessings. There are many, many blessings, and I would encourage you to read those verses. But again, God's saying, I will bless you if you keep my commandments. So it's conditional. That's how important it is to God. And remember also Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. Because this has to do with not only being obedient to God, but being faithful to him. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have I robbed you? 
in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Do you think that was just applicable back to ancient Israel? Or is that applicable for us today? Of course, it's applicable for us today. So don't rob God of his tithes and offerings. So that's part of being obedient and faithful to God. And then the third principle, which I call them God-centered principles, but the third one is to be a diligent worker all to the honor and glory of God. We've read this in Colossians chapter 3, 17 and 23 through 24. Let me just read um, verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. That says it all. So again, be a diligent worker, all to the honor and glory of God. And then the next four that we're going to go through rather quickly, those are practical principles, which, which uh, the first one would be get organized, establish a financial plan and budget. Well, does the Bible reference something like that? Yes, it does. In Proverbs 27, verses 23 and 24, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. In other words, he's saying, know what state of your assets you have. Know what you have. For the riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. So in other words, be careful with what you have. Get organized. Establish a plan. And then the next principle is spend less than you earn. Well, let's see what words of wisdom we have in Proverbs 15, 16. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. Isn't that true? Because the next one principle says, avoid debt like the pandemic. In the lesson it says, avoid the um, debt like COVID-19. I'm just saying, avoid debt like it is a pandemic. Proverbs 22, 7 says, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Avoid debt. I know in today's world, for a home and even for a car or transportation, we have to take on some debt normally. But in everything else, avoid debt like it was a pandemic or plague. And then remember, too, that the earth is not our real home. Matthew 25, um, Matthew 25 is the parable of the talents. And we're just going to read verse 29 through 30. And we know that when God gives us something, are we using that for his kingdom? Are we using it to build and further his kingdom? Verse 29, for to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. So our management in financial matters tells us a whole lot about where our ultimate priorities are. Are we using the assets that we have in managing the assets that we have to further the kingdom of God or not? And in closing, just keep in mind that when we seek all the secular and professional advice and we apply our own discipline, our own wisdom, and do all the practical steps that we just mentioned— There's a problem there, because if we don't start with the first three, the first three principles to begin with, which is to seek God and his kingdom first, to be obedient and faithful to him, and to be a diligent worker. If we don't begin with those, the rest of all that advice is going to be in vain. You may obtain some riches, but it could be a very, very rough road, and it could be destructive as well. So we need to begin with God's counsel. We also need to remember, too, that God wants us to be successful. And he'll empower us with the needed discipline to help us successfully manage the financial assets that he has blessed and entrusted us with as a steward. But God wants us to seek his counsel to help us along the way but he wants us to seek him first. When we seek him first, then he will guide us and direct us to those sources, resources, and even the people that we need to be introduced to that can help us along the way. So we need to seek God first. Amen. 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 Okay, for final thoughts. I actually loved um, Ellen White when she wrote in Education, chapter 15. 
the beginning of the chapter and the end of the chapter. Seems yeah, and the middle has a whole bunch of scripture, but so let me read it. <clears throat> there is no branch of legitimate business, keyword legitimate, business of which the Bible does not afford an essential preparation. Its principles of diligence, honesty, thrift, temperance, and purity are the secret of true success. These principles are set forth in the book of Proverbs, um, constitute a treasury of practical wisdom. Where can the merchant, the artisan, the director of men in any department of business find better maxims for himself or for his employees than are found in these words of the wise man? And that would be Solomon. <clears throat> And it gives a whole slew of examples uh, in Scripture of what mostly you shouldn't do. But um, at the end of this chapter, though, she continues to write, this is a question that demands consideration of e by every parent, every teacher, every student, by every human being, young or old. No scheme of business or plan of life can be sound or complete that embraces only the brief years of this present life and makes no provision for the unending future. Let the youth be taught to take eternity into their reckoning. Let them be taught to choose the principles and seek the possessions that are enduring, to lay up for themselves that treasure in the heavens that faileth not where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth, to make to themselves friends by means of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when it shall fail, these may receive them into the eternal tabernacles. That's Luke 12, 23. All who do this are making the best possible preparation for life in this world. No man can lay up treasure in heaven without finding his life on earth, thereby enriched and ennobled. Godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that is now and of that which is to come. 1 Timothy 4.8 This is the secret for planning for success. Sometimes the Lord hopes, or something the Lord hopes that we will all do. If you do well laying up treasure in heaven, you will automatically be a success in God's eyes here on earth. Remember, the one who has power over your life and your soul, he is the one you want to take notice of you. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, what can we say? The secret to success in this world is success in your world. Riches may come and go. You see the world and people prosper, Lord, that know nothing of you. But it's all, as Solomon would put it, vanity. It will come to nothing. Lord, teach us to store up treasure in heaven that we may spend all eternity with you. Lord, everything in this earth will someday burn and will come to ash. Teach us to do your good will and pleasure on this earth. Teach us to follow the examples of your word and to start seeking the kingdom of God because, Lord, without that foundation, nothing else can happen. We beseech your Holy Spirit to touch the hearts and minds of everyone here and, Lord, everyone watching, that your word may be made manifold in their hearts and that they will feel the fire ignited in their souls, Lord, to serve the living God above all things on this earth, that we may all someday come together and rejoice in your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, and pray all of these things to your Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Happy everyone. Sabbath.